Stay tuned for tonight's adventure with the Fat Man. Okay, here we go. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Whatever time of day it is, I hope it's good to be where you are because I'm really excited to be here today. My name is Baltimore Fats, and we're about to enter the Polygon. Yeah, oh no. All right, have fun, guys. All right, so when I was prepping the episode on The Juice, William Godwin, The Undertaker, Mary Wollstonecraft, let me know that I needed to do a better job wrapping up her story. She wasn't quite ready to give up the spotlight just yet. And so, picking up where we left off on her, Mary has returned to England after her disastrous time in France, trying to chase down her wayward husband, in quotes, American spy and real estate agent Gilbert Imlay, who's decided he's had enough of the batshit crazy that is The Undertaker. And this rejection leaves her so despondent that she tries to commit suicide by overdosing on laudanum. And luckily he's around to save her, but it's unclear how. And he sticks around enough that Mary tries a last-ditch effort to save their relationship by going on a mission for him to, of all places, Scandinavia, where she bounces around trying to find this Norwegian captain who has taken off with a bunch of silver Imlay is trying to get past the British blockade of France. And so I don't know the outcome of this mission, but of course Gil has no interest in Mary, and he takes off for good after it's done. And here the Undertaker tries to kill herself a second time, this time by jumping into the Thames. And so she walks around in the rain to get her clothes all nice and heavy and then jumps in, only to be rescued by a good Samaritan who saw the whole thing. But she rebounds quickly, and as part of her recovery, I guess, she publishes a collection of letters she wrote to Gil while on that last mission, a book called, fittingly enough, Letters Written During a Short Residence in Sweden, Norway, and Denmark. You know, Scandinavia. And we all know who does or doesn't come from Scandinavia. And The Undertaker's book, which must read like a John le Carre novel or something, is successful enough and her recovery complete enough that she rejoins her old social circle, the one that revolves around her publisher, Joseph Johnson, who I'll cast here. And remember, he facilitated the affair, or whatever it was, that The Undertaker had with Henry Fuseli, who allegedly had his own affair with Joseph he who furthers the Johnson, right? It was rumored that Johnson and Fuseli had been lovers, rumors he didn't bother to deny. And so it's at one of these social gatherings that Mary meets the Juice, who's a part of this social circle because Joseph Johnson is his publisher too, having recently published William Godwin's book, Considerations on Lord Grenville's and Mr. Pitt's Bills Concerning Treasonable and Seditious Practices and Unlawful Assemblies. And here I believe he's talking about the Right Honorable Lord Grenville, William Wyndham Grenville, first Baron Grenville, and he's a career parliamentarian and member of the Privy Councils of both England and Ireland, and he serves briefly as Prime Minister, a position that appears almost hereditary to this branch of the Grenville family. So many of them hold it. But unfortunately, I could not connect these Grenvilles to Sir Bevel's Granvilles. But my apophenia is telling me they're related somewhere down the line. And I don't want to forget that Lord Grenville here was also a fellow of the Royal Society, because of course he was. And seeing how the Grenville Granville name keeps popping up like a bad rash, you know, you know there's going to be more Grenvilles to come. And so what's really amazing about this book, or pamphlet, or whatever it was, is that it was published anonymously under the name By a Lover of Order. And that's incredible because the Juice was an anarchist. He's called the first modern proponent of anarchism. And of course, what is anarchy but the opposite of order? And so we're going to get into all of this later, but a match between he and The Undertaker seems faded. And, and though apparently they met at some earlier point, they were reintroduced in 1796, and this time, the Juice already has his heart, if not his mind, set on The Undertaker, because he loved her last book, letters written in Sweden, Norway, and Denmark, saying later in life that if there was ever, if ever there was a book calculated to make a man in love with its author, this appears to me to be the book. And so upon this reintroduction in 1796, the sparks fly, and within a year, the two marry on March 29th, 1797. Or three sets of triple sixes, if you're so inclined. And this is a shotgun wedding, because Mary Godwin, nay Shelley, was born only five months later, on August 30th. 
And so the newlyweds move into adjoining houses in Somerstown so that they could both still retain their independence. And they often communicated by notes delivered by servants. How quaint. But the most interesting thing about this is not that they live together separately, but that these adjoining houses are part of a housing complex called the Polygon. And the Polygon was an irky housing estate, a Georgian building with 15 sides and three stories that contained 32 houses. 32. And the house number that at least one of them occupied was 29, or three sixes, 666 Polygon Lane. And with this description, and knowing that a polygon is any two-dimensional geometric shape that has straight lines and sharp angles, like these, I imagine the polygon would look like it should fit on any old city plan, like this one. And this is a detail of the 1851 Baltimore City Plan, highlighting Baalta Rome. And so I'm thinking the polygon will look something like this, you know, one of these kind of shapes. But when I went looking for the polygon, I found out it looked like this. I don't know about you, but that sure looks like a circle to me. And that's very interesting because a circle is not a polygon. Circles don't consist of any straight lines. Hence, circles, look at this terrible, <laughs> I didn't even notice this before. Circle doesn't consist of ant any straight lines. Who, who lets this fly? <laughs> Hence, a circle is not a polygon. That's just incredible. Surely all these smart polymathematical people knew that, so why is this building called the Polygon? It doesn't make sense until you learn that polygons are sometimes depicted within a circle, like this. And so this circular structure, with its apparent enclosed circular courtyard, could be the perfect place to practice your, oh, I don't know, ritual black magic? I don't know, but Mary Shelley Nay Godwin is born here, and the Undertaker dies here 11 days later. And more on this bit of open speculation later, because you're never going to believe who else lived at the Polygon. Why, it's our old friend, Chucky Dickens. You know, talk about a person that just won't go away. And the Polygon features in his magnum opus, Bleak House. And though Dickens's time at the Polygon is a bit later than when Mary Shelley was born, he apparently knew the Godwins and maybe even based the Bleak House character, Harold Skimpole on the juice. And to make this pot even sweeter, the polygon is located in the center of Clarendon Square. Right? The circle gets the square. And Clarendon is a very interesting word or name because, of course, we have the Clare root right at the beginning. But I'm presuming that Clarendon Square was named after this guy, the Right Honorable Earl of Clarendon, Edward Hyde. And, of course, this makes me wonder how far Jekyll and Hyde are away from this story. And so Mr. Hyde here, he was king advisor to the King's Charles, and he's the grandfather of not one, but two queens, both Mary II and Queen Anne. So, you know, a pretty, so, you know, a pretty important guy. But also interesting about Clarendon is that it's a typeface or a font. And though it wasn't unleashed on the realm until 1845, it's very interesting to me that so many writers lived at the Polygon on Clarendon Square. And so this neighborhood and the Polygon appear to be a haven for artists, and it remained that way as late as 1832, giving this whole neighborhood, and especially the Polygon, the air of a grindhouse to Mud City. And this just gets better because the Polygon is located on the corner of Phoenix Street. And this makes me wonder what rose from the ashes here. And the Polygon is also across the street from Lansdowne Place and a block away from Grenville Street. Are you kidding me? This Grenville stuff is getting out of hand. You know, how is it that the Polygon where all this went down, has these names so close by. Names that kicked off this whole season. How is this possible? Just a little more of that Mud City magic, I suppose. And it's here, at the Polygon, that the Undertaker story ends, and Mary Godwin, nay Shelley's, begins. And the Juice is so distraught after the death of his new bride and baby mama that he throws himself into his work, namely writing a scandalous tell-all about his beloved Undertaker. Barely three months after she dies, he publishes this scandalous memoir of the author of A Vindication of the Rights of Women. And although Godwin felt that he was portraying his wife with love, compassion, and sincerity, many readers were shocked that he would reveal Wollstonecraft's illegitimate children, love affairs, and suicide attempts. This book caused a sensation, and I'm sure the Jews profited heavily from this book, though his reputation does take a hit. 
but it wasn't anywhere near as tarnished as the damage he did to his beloved's reputation, which lay in tatters for nearly a century. And it wasn't until the second wave of feminism in the 1960s that she's given the props now bestowed upon her. And so it's here that The Undertaker's story, the story of Mary from the Wolfstone Place, ends, where she leaves the juice to care for young Mary Godwin, nay Shelley, all by his lonesome. Whatever is the juice to do. So make sure you stay tuned for the next thirst-quenching episode where, hopefully, the juice will be on the loose. Remember, guys, just because you don't know the truth doesn't mean you can't have fun with the lies. And until the next one, cheers.